Okay, so good morning everyone uh, to this last lecture before the Christmas break. <coughs> we are looking today into the next kind of level of decision making. So, so far the decision making processes were basically um, how to make sure the robot stays on a certain trajectory, the trajectory is given so on the control side and now we want to go up a level towards more higher level decision making. So how should I actually navigate through the environment? Which action should I actually execute? And um, we will see that there are different ways for doing this. Um, so some of the techniques which are out there you may know already. So things like Dijkstra's algorithm, for example, is at least something that I know that a couple of people of you have heard already. And we will actually look a step further and say how can we actually perform something what we call informed search or A-star algorithm, which is an optimal search algorithm for a certain class of problems, namely for finding the shortest pass or the cost efficient pass, assuming, making some assumptions like the world is perfectly modeled, the system exactly executes these, the actions that I'm actually giving to the system. Um, and then in the second part of the lecture, we will look more towards navigation and uncertainty with something which are called Markov decision processes or MDPs, which try to relax the assumption that we have a perfectly behaving world and which take into account that the actions that we want to execute are actually affected by noise and the system may not always exactly execute what we command to the system and how we need can take this uncertainty into account in order to make better navigation decisions or general better decision making, um, de better decisions. So in, here in the lecture I constrained it mainly to motion planning, so how to go from A to B. So there's a place A where the platform is, it wants to go to a place B and how to do this in the best possible way. Um, you can also use techniques for other types of decision making but kind of at least from the examples here we constrain this to motion planning and motion planning is one of the very essential tasks that have been addressed from the early days on um, in autonomous systems, autonomous vehicles and it's one of the key capabilities of moving a platform, a robot, a vehicle from A to B in order to act in the real world. One of the key prerequisites is actually, actually able to move through the environment. And what are kind of our constraints if you want to move from A to B? So typically we just can't move freely. Um, typically we have a couple of constraints in there. And the first thing is for navigation that the path should be collision free. That means your platform should not collide with any object in the environment. So if I move from here towards the last row, I don't want to bump into all the tables and chairs here. Um, but I would like to plan a path which is slightly longer. This goes this path moves around the tables and then reaches my goal location. So the first thing is things should be collision free, so I want to have collision free trajectories and typically I'm interested in actually reaching my goal location as fast as possible. So I don't want to wander around for 10 minutes here in this area just turning around doing some stupid movement and then go to work to the goal. I want to do this as quickly as possible. And those two constraints may be in conflict with each other uh, because the shortest pass may not be the best pass from the collision point of view or for even from the collision risk point of view. So typically you have a hierarchy of different things so that reaching the goal as fast as possible is typically the least important thing and the other things which are more important and the most important thing typically is safety. So depending on your application you may have intermediate states of importance of kind of objective functions you want to fulfill. For now for this lecture here we just take into account two things, collision free trajectories and reach the goal as fast as possible and that's something that you have to trade off to some degree. So performing general path planning for solving this type of problems is actually a relatively old problem and things like the A-star algorithms have been developed in the late 60s in order to have make robots navigate along optimal trajectories and do those decision making very quickly but still it's not a fully solved problem and this is mainly due to the case that our environments are dynamic. So we don't have a perfect model of the environment at all points in time. The environment changes and how should we take those changes into account. So for example, if we have people walking through the environment, we actually want to take that into account and not collide with people, although they may not be in our map. So we need to take our sensor information into account and react appropriately. And that's something that has been problems which have been investigated for, for a long time by now. So in the last, whatever, more than 20, 25 years, a lot of algorithms have been approached uh, proposed for addressing this navigation in dynamic environments. These are most of them actually local techniques, reactive techniques. We get the sensor input and we see an obstacle very nearby and then you try to 
Now, heuristically adapt your trajectory that you, let's say, make a nice turn around the obstacle, um, that you may do a prediction that the obstacle will be going in the next one or two seconds, and take this in your planning processes into account. And um, so there are a large variant of algorithms in order to do this, in order to deal with dynamic environments or uncertainty in the environments. Here we will actually look into two things. First, the A-star algorithm, which is a planning technique and probably the most commonly used planning informed search or planning techniques. And the second step, we look into MDPs um, that takes into account what happens if our actions actually get uncertain. How can we better deal with those situations? So the key challenges that we need to address here in this motion planning problem is we want to compute an optimal pass under some cost function. And this optimality could be shortest pass, but shortest pass constraining the pass to collision-free pass. This would be, for example, one way for defining optimality. Um, we may want to take into account potential uncertainties like in the actions or maybe even in the observations or maybe even both. This renders the problems gradually more difficult. So we will look here only in the uncertainty of the actions, assuming we have a sensor which tells us the truth, so to say. But if you take into account that our sensor may be wrong and our actions may be noisy, the task gets even more complicated or substantially more complicated than these Markov decision processes that we will discuss today. And we typically want to have systems that can quite quickly react to unforeseen obstacles and also can take into account motion. So these are kind of the key challenges that we have in motion planning or in navigation systems and they have been around since a long time and they are still unsolved to a large degree. Of course systems get better, compute, we have more compute, we can compute better solutions, we have better sensors, better interpretation algorithms to better estimate those moving obstacles. But if you really want to address this from, a, from an optimal point of view, our algorithms are extremely complicated in order to compute really optimal trajectories taking into account all the uncertainties. So this is something which uh, you can do for smaller problems, but if you really want to go large scale, that's um, pretty challenging still today. Um, if you build a, a system, a real physical system, which navigates through the environment, you typically have a layered architecture, and you can, may have sometimes two layers, maybe sometimes three layers. It depends a bit on what your actual problem is. But I kind of broke it down into kind of three layers here, and these are the typical things that you do. The first thing is actually the planning level. So planning level means we have a model of the environment, this may be my map here, I know where my platform is, and then I make on a higher level a computer path which is the optimal path towards my goal, taking account the map information. So what is the shortest path to go from one office to another office? Which sequence of, let's say, local waypoints I may approach in order to drive along a globally optimal trajectory. What we typically ignore in this planning level, at least in most realistic systems, is all the details of the platform itself. Not all, but a couple of details. What are, what are accelerations that the platform can only execute? Uh, what are certain constraints in motion? They are often ignored or only on a very coarse approximation level being taken into account. So what we get out here is something which is optimal, but to a slightly simpler problem than the problem that we actually have in reality. And often we don't take dynamics into account in the, on this level. Then basically we may get a sequence of Project uh, of, of waypoints towards our goal, and then we have typically a collision avoidance system. And this runs at a much higher frequency because planning is computationally expensive for you, so you may want to run this on a, whatever, once per second, or once every three seconds or ten seconds, something in this order, depending on how complex your plans are. But collision avoidance, you have to run at a higher frequency because you want to react to, let's say, people moving around in the environment. And it depends a little bit on the speed that your platform has, so sometimes two or five hertz uh, frequency for the collision avoidance may be fine if you're driving faster or you are more in the uh, area where, where safety matters because you can, let's say, hurt or injure or kill a person, um, then you want to increase this frequency uh, far beyond two hertz. You want to execute this much, much faster. And what these systems do, they typically take the sensor observations into account and basically see if something not in line with the map and then generate trajectories which are collision free. And they typically take the properties of the platform into account. So here, these systems typically know something about accelerations that the platform can execute. What's the stopping distance? The platform can't stop immediately. Things like this are taken into account in these collision avoidance modules. 
You typically also have the precise shape of your platform taken into account, which planners typically also approximate. And then sometimes you still have a low-level controller in here, which generates these kind of collision avoidance movements, which are still typically planned in the XY orientation or XY orientation and uh, velocity space into a hardware controller. And this is a system which typically sits in the platform, sometimes implemented in hardware, which makes sure that the platform actually follows the trajectory the way you want it to be. So sometimes the collision avoidance take the, the notation of the controller depending on how much control you have about your platform. But the more dynamic your platform gets, the more you may take accelerations into account or forces in the platform you may need or want to have an additional controller on the lower level. Um, so this is kind of the, the ecosystem we are in, and we are basically addressing those two areas here. So mainly the planning part, but we'll very briefly also kind of touch a little bit the collision avoidance. But mainly we are today here in the, on that planning level. OK, so if you look to the motion planning problem, uh, what do we have? We typically have a start configuration or a start pose of the platform. So we know where the system is right now. And we know where we want to go. So we assume that we have a goal pose or a goal state where we want to be in. So for example, this could be my start state. This could be my goal state. And then the question is, how do I move from here to there? Typically need to have whatever a description about the environment. I need to know where that table is. Um, or in some representation about my size. And then I can compute a path. The path could be, in this case, whatever. Rotate by 90 degrees, move 2.5 meters forward, rotate again by 90 degrees, go half a meter forward, turn again by 90 degrees. That will be a plan, an output of the algorithm, which guides me with the, let's say, shortest sequence of actions into my goal location. So that's basically the result that we want to get. And what we again have, we have start and goal pose. And we have some description about the platforms, about, let's say, my size. If I would be that big, I wouldn't fit in this state. I would collide with this table. So I would need to take that into account. Um, and of course, a representation of the environment. What we sometimes have in here as well is some additional notation of how costly it is to do something. So if we say, OK, I'm navigating here only on the flat ground, I can say every second is associated with some cost. If there is a more complex movement, like whatever, climbing on those tables, Maybe climbing on a table is associated with a higher cost, and I would like to avoid climbing on the table if I can also make a detour around the table. So there may be cost functions involved, how expensive certain actions are, um, but not necessarily. If I'm not explicitly talking about a cost function, we assume the same cost for whatever we do. And then what we're interested, we want to find a path or a trajectory towards this from the start to the goal location. It should be typically collision-free. That means I should never touch whatever the table or any other obstacle. And typically, I'm interested in the shortest path or some notation of minimum cost path um, or approximate minimum cost path. Like, I don't want to first make whatever 100 rotations on the spot and then move here, because it's basically just losing time there without contributing to my problem. OK, so this is kind of what the motion planning problem is about. State A and state B are given. We have a description of how the system reacts, we have a description of the environment, and then what's the sequence of actions or poses which guides me from state A gradually towards state B. Okay. So are there any questions about, at that point, about what the problems we are going to investigate in the next steps or in the remaining part of the lecture today? OK, so if they're not the case, let's continue. And there's one important thing which is called the configuration space. So although the planning typically lives in, an, in, let's say, in the 2D world, in my example, where I am from my start position to my final position, there may be, the system may consider different, may plan in a different space. So in the simplest example, this could be the state of x, y, and orientation. That would be then my configuration space, how I, how I address a configuration in my space, so x, y, and orientation, for example. So again, start configuration would be here. Goal configuration would be here. Then I could represent by an XY location and my orientation. If I, however, need to take into account during the planning how fast I go, so let's say speeds, how fast I run or I navigate, um, then this configuration space, space can become more complex. Let's say I can only I have constraints on my acceleration and deceleration. I want to accelerate and reach my goal um, to, to increase my speed in order to reach my goal. And I have constraints in the acceleration. So if I'm running very fast, I may not be able to turn instantly here, because I first need to slow down. And then I can do something. 
So there may be configurations or a configuration of the platform where the planning problem is typically executed to, which can be more complex than just the XY or XY orientation space. And the planner typically works in this configuration space. And there are configurations which may not be possible to achieve. And so this space can be a bit more complex. Um, often it overlaps with, this, with, the, with the physical space, with the XY space we're living in, but it can be more, uh, more complex. Um, what we often do in practice is actually discretizing this configuration space. So it's not something you must do, but most planning systems do that, that we say, okay, we discretize the space similar to an occupancy grid map, where you say, we only consider a, a certain subset of configurations, like every grid cell is a 10 by 10 centimeter cell, if you remember the occupancy grid map uh, lecture from Nivet giving in the beginning of that course, where you represent if an environment is, or a space is free or occupied, you may want to discretize the space where the system can be to those cells. The robot is in one cell, or in the cell next to it, or in the cell next to it. So you basically discretize your possible configuration, let's say, in increments of 10 centimeters or something like this. You can do this to simplify your planning problem, because then you have less states you need to take into account. You also may not want to take into account all possible orientations, but maybe discretize your orientation to 45 degrees, for example. So either looking here, or here, or here, or here. So you just have a subset of orientations. Or you want to have a more fine-grained resolution, let's say a one degree resolution, and then you would have 360 possible orientations the system can be in. This depends a little bit on your problem, on the task you want to solve, on your computational constraints that you have. And if you think about a very simple 2D world, like an occupancy grid map, so green means you occupied, white is free space, then you could turn this into a conf discretized configuration space where every configuration is basically given by those circles over here, and you see those basically eight connected neighborhood with these lines over here, which gives you the possible orientations the platform can be in to go from one state to the next state. So it basically gives you a graph of nodes of possible configurations, which are here x, y, and you additionally have an orientation where you can go to go from one state to the other. And this is a discretized version of your configuration space. In this case, it overlaps quite well with the metric space we are, we are in, so our XY space. But um, this can be, this, all of those nodes may have different dimensions. They may take into account velocities or um, accelerations or additional things into account that your platform may have. So for example, in, if you have an Ackermann drive, you may take into account the current steering angle that you have because you know that based on the steering angle, based on your velocity, this has an impact on future states. Yeah. So these are maybe additional things that you need to take into account. So then the question is how do we actually go from one location to another location? So let's say this is my start location S over here and I want to go to my goal location G down here. So the path would probably go whatever, somewhere down here and reaching this state or maybe somewhere up here. These were possible ways to reach the goal location from that start location. And we want to find now that it basically this sequence of nodes which actually make this move. So, for example, from here, first move down, 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 then maybe diagonally here, straight here, and diagonally down here. So this would be a path. This is actually a pretty close path, probably the closest or the shortest path from the start location to the goal location. The question is, how do I find it? How do I find this path? This is the planning problem we're looking into. And one way for solving those planning problems is through search algorithms. So in the search algorithm, I start at uh, the, my start node, typically, and I'm basically looking into my neighbor nodes, neighboring nodes of that start node, and say, OK, which of those nodes is potentially leading me to my goal? Maybe you have some information about in which direction the goal is, but maybe you don't have that information. Maybe you just don't know anything, you're just looking into nodes until you find your neighboring, your, your goal node. So you could start expanding all neighbor nodes, all neighbor nodes, further, 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 whatever, at some point in time. You'll say, oh, now I found this, the goal node, perfect, I found it. So basically on the way I search the graph, I will actually get a path how to reach from my start location to my goal location. Maybe you take additional information into account if you know something about your goal location, your goal state, and then you can actually speed up your search. But in general, it's a search problem. So it's a search problem typically defined on a graph because the configuration space is typically represented as a graph where the nodes are the possible configurations 
and the edges between the configurations are basically, um, let's say, is, an, is an navigation information how to go from one configuration to another configuration. <coughs> like, <coughs> sorry, a velocity command that you may have executed. And in search, we um, dis distinguish between different types of searches. One group of search algorithms are called the informed search algorithms, another co are called the uninformed search algorithms. Um, so you can say uninformed doesn't have any additional information, so it's basically a blind search technique. We just kind of open notes and see if you actually find your target node. And other algorithms are approaches which have some information about where the goal configuration is or might be or have some heuristics and can exploit this heuristic as additional information in order to speed up the search in order to be more efficient. Of course, it should be clear if you're in an uninformed search and you're just basically opening your notes to see, is it the goal node? No. Continue. Pick its neighbor. Is it the goal node? No. Put it away. Next one. Is it the goal node? Yes. No. And make a decision like this. It may not be the smartest choice to do. If you know, however, that let's say the goal is somewhere over here, you may prefer taking opening notes and checking notes which are kind of on the way to the potential goal location. So if you have additional information, you can do better. And this is something which is called the informed search. So the informed search has something which we typically call a heuristic. So this is some additional information that gives you an idea how good or useful or promising a note could be. So let's say I know that my goal location is somewhere over there. I don't know what's here in the middle, in between, but I know it's somewhere over here. It's typically better to open my left node rather than my right node, because the left node is potentially better, because it's potentially closer to my, my goal location than opening this node. So it may be better that I say, before opening this one, I actually open this one first. And then, okay, now again, should I open this one or this one? Oh, this looks better. I'm tending to go, to go towards this direction. I can bias my search in this direction. Of course, it can be a case that some smart person build a wall over here. So I will look around this wall and say, okay, there's nothing I can do. I can't do. Then let's explore what's going on here. And yes, you have a tendency to prefer states which are closer to the goal. This is what a heuristic can do. It's not a perfect measure, but it's kind of a hint on what could be good. So it's the same for you if you think you're a human in a city you don't know, and you know you want to reach the cathedral. Let's say it's an old city with whatever, a lot of narrow streets, but you're standing on a place and you actually see the top of the cathedral somewhere. You say, okay, the cathedral is over there. I don't know exactly how to reach it because it has a lot of small paths in the city. But you say, I probably should walk towards this direction and not in the opposite direction. In most of the cases, you do a good job walking towards the cathedral, towards the top of the cathedral that you see. This you can see as an informed search because you don't know the exact path. And you, maybe in the street's blocked over there, but most of the time, it's a good idea to walk it towards the right direction. So this is exactly heuristic, and this is something that informed search algorithms actually use. And again, the most popular one is this A-star search, developed by Nielsen's in the late 90s for actually solving navigation, um, for navigation problems of this type. There are many variants of this A-star algorithm today which are more efficient or can deal with time constraints or relax some assumptions or make some stronger assumptions then are more efficient. Um, or are good for replanning, like the variant of D-star algorithms, which try, if I don't plan once, but plan multiple times, can I reuse information I had before? So there are a lot of variants out there, but typically A-star is your standard first choice for whatever planning problem you're looking into, because it's comparably easy to implement, it's pretty efficient, and as soon as you can define such a heuristic, some guess of what's good or what's bad, you actually are very efficient. So typically those search algorithms um, have different properties and there may be mainly four dimensions that we look into in order to evaluate or rate our planning algorithms. So one thing is, so there are, there are four criterion, completeness, optimality, time complexity and space complexity. Um, so space complexity means how much memory do I need to solve my problem? So often you need to have at least some memory to store the length of the trajectory in space because you need to memorize how to go from A to B. Or you, sometimes you need to store all possible states in memory. Sometimes you need to, to, to store even more in memory depending on your algorithm. So the space complexity basically means how much memory do I need in order to run my, my, my planning problem. The time complexity 
basically means how long does it take me to find a solution. And typically this how long we don't quantify in seconds or milliseconds, but in number of states that I need to, need to access, number of states that I need to consider, need to open. So how many nodes I inspect and say, is it the goal node, yes, no, what to do with it? I basically count this as one time unit, and I'm basically looking how many nodes I, I kind of inspect. Sometimes time matters. It depends a little bit on how you want to analyze your algorithms. These two are also pretty important ones. So one is optimality and completeness. Optimality means does the system give me the best possible solution? So there are algorithms which guarantee that I can give you a solution and there's no better solution than my solution. There may be equivalently good solutions because sometimes you just have two trajectories. They have the same lengths. There's no reason to prefer one above the other, but you can guarantee there's no better one than this one. And it's actually a nice property. If you say, here's a solution, you can't do better than that. It's so, okay, done. Nothing else needs to be done. I'm very happy. If, I've, if I have an optimal algorithm, I'm typically very happy because I know I can't do better, whatever I do. At least under the assumptions of the algorithm, so because every algorithm has some assumptions. Um, so it's similar to the Kalman filter. The Kalman filter in state estimation for the, if you live in a Gaussian world and ever, everything is linear, Kalman filter is an optimal state estimator. There's no reason to use something else in the Kalman filter, unless you have nonlinearities, unless you violate the Gaussian world assumption. And same here. Under the assumption of our planning algorithms, and these assumptions can be the discretized configuration space. All the actions are executed exactly in the way that I wanted the system to execute them. Then we may come up with an optimal solution. Okay? And completeness means, um, does the algorithm, algorithm actually report a solution if there exists a solution? So there can be algorithms, especially randomized algorithms, um, which may not be able to find a solution. Because there are uh, random components, elements in there. Um, so typically, there are things like, if you run your algorithms infinitively long, it will actually find a solution. Um, but there, there are different variants of guaranteeing completeness or just providing completeness most of the time. So that's something that we typically want to take into account. So do we find a solution if there exists one? And if we find one, is it the optimal one? And as we will see, the A-star algorithm actually is a complete and optimal algorithm. So if we can, under some constraints or some assumptions in A-star, or, or something we need to take care of, uh, we can actually show that we actually will find a solution, and it's also the optimal solution. Okay. But before that, let's start with some approaches with respect to uninformed search. So if we have a tree, let's say a tree structure, let's say our current node is a node number one, and we look for a path in um, uh, a goal configuration, the question is, in which order should I actually open the nodes? And there's a breadth first search, which basically, if you see this as a tree structure, it starts here on the top level and then expands all its neighbors. And only after all its neighbors are visited, it basically goes to the neighbors of the neighbors. So you go, this one over here. Okay, my neighbors are two, three, and four. So I will process two, then three, and then four. You go two, three, four, I couldn't find anything. And they say, okay, and then take the other neighbors into account. So, and first I start with the neighbors of two, five and six, nothing found. Then I go to three, has no neighbors. Then four, seven and eight are my neighbors. And you process them kind of level by level. This is called a breadth first search. And you basically have a, a data structure where you put in new nodes you're going to consider. And what is first in is basically a first in, first out data structure. Whatever you put in first gets taken out first. So you take your node, you add all your neighbors to that queue, and then you, once you're done, take the first one out and process this one. And then once you're done with this one, you, you take all the neighbors and add it to the end of the queue. And then you take out the second one and the third one. And this will at least will immediately give you this structure over here, where you level by level process your data structure. Um, this will lead to the fact that you will visit all possible nodes. So if there's a solution, you will actually find the solution. And it will also be an optimal algorithm, but only under the assumption that expanding all of those nodes here comes all at the same cost. So going from 1 to 2 has a, is, is associated with the same cost than two, 1 to 3 and 1 to 4. So there's no kind of thing which is cheaper. Let's say everything, every expansion costs you 10 cents. If they're all the same cost, this algorithm will actually give you the optimal solution. But if you are... Um, 
if you can have different costs like going from one to four is cheaper than from one to two, then it may not find the optimal solution because um, it, it may not open or consider the nodes in the right order and it stops until the first node has been, uh, the goal node has been found. An alternative for this is depth first search. There you don't start all the neighbors into account. You basically open the first neighbor, then the neighbor of the neighbor, and then the neighbor of the neighbor until there are no neighbors left. And then you basically gradually go back this tree. So it's with the same data structure. I have my queue. So I visit a node. I don't put it to the end of the queue. I put it actually to the beginning of the queue. And so then is the next one I'm actually considering again. OK? So this is what's called a depth first search. So you can actually run through those nodes until you found the first configuration. This is a problem, if, especially if you have infinitely large spaces. So let's say you can explore the whole world, but your goal location is actually very nearby. It can lead to the fact that this explores the whole world, but doesn't look in the local neighborhood. So this is one of the things that depth first search can run into problems. What we however do in practice more often is something that we call greedy search. So greedy search typically uses a cost function, or in greedy search a cost function is more often used. Um, and it basically says how costly it was, it takes into account how costly it was to expand the current node. So in, in every point in time, in every decision making process, it says give me the best, the cheapest node I looked in so far. And let's continue with this node. Cheap could be means um, whatever, in terms of distance, the closest node to my current configuration. So if all the costs are identical, so if all, all the costs are, are the same, this actually uh, goes down to depth. Oh, sorry, that's a mistake. It's not depth first search, it's breadth first search. This is sorry, this is a mistake. Um, because then you're basically going level by level, because you are. Um, if all the costs are the same, basically the level is identical to the cost. But if you, for example, see that going from one to four is cheaper, as a low, smaller cost than going from one to two, you will expand node four first. And then maybe going down here, reaching seven, is still cheaper than going for two because the costs along these paths are much, much uh, smaller. So you're basically opening the node based on the cost. So again, if you have, for example, with our data structure, we install things, we take a node, we take all these neighbors and add the neighbors to the queue, and the position in the queue depends on the cost of the node. And then you always get the cheapest one out. You always select out the cheapest one and expand the cheapest one. This is kind of what we call a greedy search, because we are greedily, in every point in time, optimizing for this minimal uh, cost path. So in those of you um, sorry, uh, who, have been, who have been working or have seen Dijkstra's algorithm is, um, the Dijkstra's algorithm and greedy search is something actually which is very similar. So Dijkstra's algorithm is an algorithm which provides you the path information or the, the distance to the, from all nodes in your, in your space until with respect to one node. And this one single node, this can be your start node, you're expanding all the cost to all the other nodes and you're basically not stopping your search. You basically run your search until everything has been visited. And you're storing this accumulated cost as the cost in your queue. So how long does it take me to reach that node from the start node? And if you run this really search until the end, this basically turns out to be Dijkstra's algorithm. This algorithm that most of you or quite a substantial potential or subset of you have already heard. Okay. What we in practice do most of the time, however, is not Dijkstra. We basically run an informed search in terms of A star. So the difference is, is that we assume to have some background knowledge. And the key thing that the informed search uh, provides is actually some information about a guess how cheap it is to reach a different node. So if I want to reach the corner, the point in the corner over there, I want to have an estimate how expensive is it potentially from my current location to go there. I only want to have an estimate. A heuristic. It doesn't need to be the optimal cost, but an estimate. And I typically have some constraints on the estimate. So typically one of the constraints or the key constraint is that my estimate should be smaller than the real cost, or smaller or equal than the real cost. So the good thing is, if I'm here, I need to, would need to turn here and then actually walk over here to 
to stay in this node. I can actually estimate quite well how long it will take me from here to navigate in this corner. How could I estimate or provide a lower bound how long it will take me to go from here into this corner? Any, any ideas? Yeah? Uh, you can compute the Euclidean distance. Exactly. If I take into account the Euclidean distance, or so the straight line distance between my configuration and the configuration of the corner, I can be sure there's no better way to go from here to there than on the, on the straight line distance. It will be the shortest possible pass. If everything is free space, it's the best thing I can do. I can't, or I can, under no circumstances do better. Even if there's an obstacle in between, I may need to make a detour, and the detour will only make it more expensive. Okay? So it's a lower bound. I can't get better than walking on a straight line distance. As long as I can't teleport myself there, which I assume we can't do that, there's no way to do better than moving along the straight line distance. So this is a very, very good estimate, which guarantees to always underestimate the real cost or be the real cheapest cost if everything is free space, and provides me with a very good guess on how expensive it will be to go there. So for example, I can say I'm right now here, and I can estimate for another node, which I don't know yet, let's say some node over here, I may know how expensive it is to go there, and I can estimate how expensive could it be from this node to reach the goal? by just taking the straight line distance from this node to my goal location into account. And it gives me some idea on how good can I get. And this information is used in informed search to actually do better. And so I have a small example coming back to the configuration that we had. Is that we want to go from the start node to, my, to the goal node and expand only those nodes which are potentially better or have the potential to be better to what we do. And this is kind of a small video which shows you how the different nodes are expanded. Okay, now it gets a bit tricky. Um, to fit fast. Let's stop it. Come on. Oops. Okay. So this is always currently the best current node that we have. All the nodes which are black are nodes which I already have considered, taken into account and said, ah, not, not needing to consider them anymore. And those which are blue are those nodes here we say, maybe this node has a neighbor I haven't looked into. Maybe I can still, uh, maybe this is a node I still need to consider in case I can't find a better path. And you basically run this algorithm. And so in the end, it will find this path over here from start to goal with the shortest path. But it could have been, let's say, this, let's say here in this way, there's a small passage. It would not be blocked. You only know by actually going here, which could lead to a shorter path down here. Therefore, the, 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 the algorithm was also expanding those nodes in here. Because it could have been that there's a shorter path going down here. But at some point in time, the system realized, OK, it can't get shorter here to what I have found over here. And then it expands those nodes down here. It doesn't continue expanding those nodes here. That's kind of the idea that you only expand nodes where you say, the cost to go from here to here and the estimated cost of a straight line here is at some point in time bigger than the cost that I'm going down here. And if I say, if this estimated cost is bigger than what I already know, I don't need to take that into account because I know it's only a low, lower bound. And if I'm better than the potential lower bound, there's no need to take into account further information over here. OK, so how does it work in practice? So what we have is we have three cost functions in, in A star. So one is typically a function which is called g of n. So n is a node, and g is actually the actual cost that it takes me from my initial configuration to reach that state. So if this is the start location, let's say this bucket here is my start location, which is standing over here. So I start from here, and I want to reach the location over there. And so um, I may have in a, in a node, let's say I'm, I'm currently in this configuration, then the g cost of this node tells me how expensive it is to go from that bucket to this location. This is the g cost, the actual cost that it took me. So it could be that I'm here and say, okay, rotate 90 degrees, it costs me 10 cents. And then go 20 centimeters forward, another 10 cent, so 20 cent. And half a meter forward, let's say 50 cent, so it's 20, 20, 50, 90 cent. It takes me 90 cents to reach this place. So that would be the cost of that place, of that node. And that is g. Okay, the actual cost. And then I have the H cost, which is typically called the heuristic. 
h. The heuristic is how, what do I estimate? How expensive will it be from this place to actually go in that corner to my goal configuration? And therefore, again, I use, for example, a straight line distance. Let's say whatever, five meters. Te a meter always costs a euro, so that must be at least five bucks to go there. So I spent already 90 cents to reach this place, but when I'm here, it takes me at least five bucks to reach this location over there. And these five bucks are the, my H cost, my heuristic, my estimated cost. And I know it can only be more expensive. It can't get cheaper than that. Okay? Is it clear what the difference is between the G cost and the H cost, between the actual cost and the heuristic? Okay. Then the F cost is the sum of both. It's a sum for every node. It says what did I spend so far to go from the start location, from the blue bucket to this location, plus the minimum cost to the goal. And this gives me an evaluation how good that node that I'm at, in is actually. Because it tells me to count what, did I, what I, did I already spend to reach it and how much do I potentially need to reach my goal. And what the algorithm basically does, it does all its evaluation based on this F cost and says, okay, based on the F cost, I'm basically sorting all my nodes based on this F cost and always try to take into account, take the cheapest one, the one with the cheapest F cost into account in order to proceed forward. And we can actually show that this leads to an optimal solution as long as these <coughs> the H cost, the heuristic, is smaller or equal to the actual cost. As soon as the heuristic is overestimating the cost, I may do a wrong decision and I use the optimality of the A star algorithm. Because it could be, just to give you an example, that on the straight line path is the best possible pass. Let's assume that. So by just going here, one, two, three, four, five meters, paying five bucks, that's the best thing I can do. But if I estimate, and let's say in, and I have a node here, and from here to there, it's five bucks, 10. So it's a bit more expensive because I'm a little bit further away. If I now would overestimate my cost, so doing something wrong and say, it doesn't cost me five bucks at minimum here, but six bucks. I would say, okay, six bucks sounds more expensive than five bucks, 10. Let's go for this one with four, for five euro 10 to actually go there. And you would take a wrong note because you're actually overestimating the cost of the actual best one. And therefore, if you want to get guarantee that you find an optimal solution, your heuristic must always underestimate the real cost or be equal to the real cost, of course. But that's what you want to have. And your algorithm is faster the better your heuristic gets. So the closer the heuristic actually approaches the actual cost, the better your search will be. If you have already the perfect cost, if you have a perfect heuristic, the, the heuristic which actually the oracle will tell you how actually expensive every node is, you will just need to follow this optimal F cost, this optimal H cost. Okay? So this is kind of the optimal heuristic. That's something that we typically don't know. We only know this when we solved our planning problem because then we know how expensive it is to go from one state to the other one. So if we solved our problem already, that would be H star. And we, we want to have that the actual heuristic is as close as possible to H star, but it must always be smaller. We should not overestimate because then we lose optimality. Okay? Okay, and then we have a nice sketch how the A star algorithm works. So we start up over here. And it's very si similar to the example I, I told you before with this Q. And basically, the, the only question is, how is this Q organized? And it's like this in all the algorithms. So, okay. So I start from my start location. And then, uh, so O is my Q. Um, typically, we call the priority Q. And the priority it means, uh, so it gives you a prioritization or an order in which the nodes will be taken out of that Q. This is actually the F cost. Okay, so let's start with O. Oh, first ask, is the Q empty? The Q stores all the nodes I still need to take into account. If there's no further nodes to consider, I'm done. I searched my whole graph. There's nothing else I can do. I'm done. But typically, this is not the case. So the queue is seldomly empty. What you do is you take out the best node out of that queue, the cheapest one, and cheapest according to F cost. So the one which has the best F cost. You take the other node, which is the best F cost, means the node where, given all the information that you have so far, will be the best one, the closest one to the goal, the one which has the best potential to give you the shortest path. Okay? 
And then you basically you take out this node from the priority queue. So you actually physically pick it out. Then you inspect this node and ask yourself, okay, is this actually the goal state? Is it already the goal? If it is the goal, I say, okay, perfect. I found my goal done. Found the best pass. But again, most of the time it won't be the state. So you're not at your goal state. And then what you do is you take the node out and look to all its neighbors. So all the other states which I can actually reach from this state. These are all the neighbors. And for all the neighbors, I recompute the F cost. Because now I say, okay, I know now how expensive it was to, to reach my node. I know how expensive it is to go from one node to the neighbor node, because this is the cost which is associated to the edge. Let's say this 10 cent action, this minimum action. And then I actually, then assuming I would be here, how expensive would it be to go from here to the goal? Again, the heuristic. So you're basically pushing the node a little bit further by saying, I have a bit more of actual cost and a bit less of estimated cost. And this gives you a new cost value for this node. And then you're basically putting this node, this neighbor node, again to the priority queue. In theory, you need to check if it is already in there. If it's already in there, you just update it or take it out and put the new node in. It's a matter of efficiency, what, what you do, but in the end, you just take, I have the neighbor, and I just put the neighbor into the queue again under the assumption that the queue, that the neighbor is not in there, uh, or the, if the node is in there, I would need to update. I can also keep the node, I need to update its cost in there. And then I continue with my process. Again, take my queue, take the cheapest node out, check, is it the goal? No. Look all the neighbors, update all the cost of the neighbors, put them into the queue again. And I repeat this process until either the queue is empty or until I found my goal state. And the only thing which has changed between this informed search and this uninformed search, or the greedy search, is that the cost in this priority queue is different. In the greedy search, I only take into account what did I pay so far. And in the informed search, I take into account what did I pay so far plus what do I estimate to need to pay in the future. Only an estimate. What is an estimate? If my estimate is good, I will make a very good and smart choice and will only pick the nodes which probably lead me very close to the goal. If my estimation capabilities are completely bad and I think, oh, it always costs me nothing, I'm basically already there, so my H cost will be zero, then the informed search will actually degenerate to greedy search because then it's just the G cost. And the more you know, the better your search will get. The more you know about a node, the better you will get. Always under the constraint that you need to underestimate the cost. Okay? So the good thing is for a lot of planning problems in, the, in our real world, in the 2D world as well as in the 3D world, we have straight line distances. We have this Euclidean distance between two nodes, which is a very, very, very good heuristic. So whenever we plan in the 2D world or the 3D world, the straight line distance, the Euclidean distance between two configurations is an extremely good heuristic. We should always exploit it. We seldomly can do better. We can do better if we have some additional information or we planned already and want to replan and use the results of the last planning results. So we can do quite complex things to get better, but you clean the distance is so easy to compute and gives us such a valuable information, we should always use it. This is different if you move to different configuration spaces. If you go for different configuration spaces where additional information matters or where you live in a world of velocities or something like this, or you can do data association searches in those graphs, you can do a lot of complex things with those graphs or search algorithms, then things become more and more complicated. As, long, as soon as you lose the ability to easily formulate a good heuristic, it gets the, the, the gain of informed search gets smaller. Still gain something, if you can say at least a little bit, but the, it shows a really great performance if you have a good heuristic and for planning in the 2D or 3D world, the straight line distance is extremely good. So again, if we plan in this grid world, um, we typically take, in all the examples I have here, this eight neighbor into account, so I can move from every node to, to one of its neighbor nodes. So from here to here, uh, it's basically cost one, and here the cost is cost square root of two, just based on the Euclidean distance from here to here. And so you have typically different cost. Um, and then if, <coughs> let's say, this is, your start you know, um, this is your start location, this is your goal location, and you can see based on these gray values which of the nodes the A star, the A -star search will expand. Um, because in the beginning, 
the estimate for all of those costs with the straight line distance is just slightly smaller. And so you start updating your cost, oh, maybe it gets cheaper over here. And at some point in time, you realize, no, no, I, this won't get cheaper than this one. Then you go here, maybe there's a shortcut here, which you don't know yet if you don't, haven't expended those notes. But at some point in time, you will actually realize that this is your shortest pass. If you would do a greedy search, so just without taking the prediction to the goal into account, the cost you basically would take into account can be seen basically approximated by a circle around this. So all those nodes in that circle you would expend um, because these are the nodes which are potentially cheaper if you don't take the predictions to the goal into account. If you take the predictions into account, you end up with something like this. Okay, now I have a question to you. Assuming I give you all the computational resources that you want and all the algorithms that you know already you can use, do you have a way or can you tell me a way how you could come up with the optimal heuristic. So with the best possible heuristic, let's say if just for planning in the 2D world, just a 2D grid, you can go from one node to the neighbor node, so exactly this problem. Can you tell me how you could compute the optimal heuristic that tells you for every node exactly the cost to the goal node? Is there a way you could do that? And if so, how? What do you exactly mean with distance? Um, no, because the Euclidean distance, of course, is a, is a very good heuristic, but it's not the optimal one. What's true is it always underestimates, um, but it could be, for example, I'll give you an example why it's not the optimal. So what you want, what the heuristic should do, it should estimate how expensive it is go from he, from my current location to my goal location. Let's say this is my goal location over here, and this is my actual location. And so my straight line heuristic would be by the whatever, uh, it's kind of two meters away over there in this direction and then the cost associated to this two meter travel. But what I need to do in reality, I need to go around the table. So it's not two meters, it's a three meter path. So you are underestimating, so it's still okay, it's still admissible, but it's not the optimal heuristic because you told me two meters, but in reality three meters. Now I want to actually get the exact cost out. This is the optimal heuristic. Yeah? Yeah. And then if you find like a straight line again to the goal, yeah. you're going straight. Yes, this brings you close, but how to compute this? How to do this? Okay. Maybe we can backtrack from the goal. So Yeah, you're coming closer. If we are at the goal, yeah. and then we take a step back from the goal, we know the distance. And then we take one step back, then we take the middle distance. <laughs> yeah, you're coming close. It's not, not fully there yet, but it kind of goes in the right direction. So consider you can use any algorithms that we've talked about. So let's say, okay, I want to I deploy a robot in this world, in this room here, and it should run the rest of its time in this room. And the room will not change. Can you do a lot of pre-computations to actually give me then the optimal heuristic? So you can actually come back to Dijkstra's algorithm. If you can remember, what does Dijkstra's algorithm do? Dijkstra's algorithm tells you what the shortest path, or the, the, the shortest path cost, for every node in the world with respect to one other node. Right? It's a one-to-all shortest path problem algorithm. So you basically run Dijkstra's algorithm in your environment with the node being the, um, the goal node. And then you know for every node in the environment what the shortest path cost to go there. This basically means you solve your planning problem once, have the optimal heuristic, and then you just need to go through this heuristic. So it's a little bit of cheating, but there's a reason why I introduced this. Um, so this is an example of Dijkstra's algorithm. So this is the goal cost. And so kind of brighter color means lower cost. And so this is the cost distribution that you would get. So if you're here, the cost is high because you actually need to go around here. Once you're here, the cost is smaller, and the further you're away, the, the higher the cost get. So if you have that, what you basically need to do only, you just need to perform basically a gradient descent in this cost map, and then you will actually reach the goal. 
Why this is important or relevant, this type of uh, heuristic, is that you can use it to pre-compute a heuristic for the XY space even if your configuration space gets more complicated. So let's say if you have take orientation into account, something we ignored completely in this XY. This is just XY cost, no orientation here. You can say, if I'm here and I want to be here, I know what I need to do is I need to actually estimate that I need to, okay, I need to rotate, then I need to travel there, and I need to rotate again. So you can say, at least I can approximate the cost by going from here to here, ignoring the or orientation completely, which is basically this one, and then just take at the difference in orientation into account. So I can use this to assemble more complicated heuristics, which solve me part of the planning problem. And especially if you go to higher dimensional state spaces or configuration spaces, um, the higher the number of dimensions, the compl more complicated your planning problem gets. And if you can optimize your heuristic by taking this info additional information into account, you actually get much faster. So if you do this, this heuristic, you're actually pretty close to doing the right thing. Another thing where this is super important is um, if you assume the world is static, it's the optimal thing you can do. If you now assume the world is dynamic, it's not the optimal thing anymore, right? So assume we have people walking around here. That means those people could actually block the optimal path and then this heuristic is not valid, it's not uh, the optimal one anymore. But as long as we, do, as we don't remove any obstacle from this map, as soon as we add only new things like people walking around in the environment, it's still admissible because it still, it still underestimates the cost. It estimates I can walk through that person, which I can't, so I will make a small detour, but at least I'm underestimating the cost. So what's often done in environments is if you have, you take into account only the things which are absolutely not movable, like the walls and things like this into account here, and use pre-compute this Dijkstra once, use it as a heuristic, so even if you have people walking around, your planner is super fast and can be executed multiple times per second, because if there's no person around, it will actually immediately give you the right solution, and if, a, if persons are around, you just need to make very small adaptations to this heuristic. So therefore, although, uh, some people looked a little bit concerned when I said just use Dijkstra. I said, yeah, of course you're cheating. If you compute your problem before, of course it's solved. But it has a very big practical implication because even if your world then changes a little bit, this optimal solution for the static world is still an extremely good heuristic for the dynamic world. And that's the reason why in practice you actually do that very often. You run Dijkstra's algorithm once and use this as your near optimal heuristic and if you have dynamics in the scene, it just will make it a little bit worse, but not much. And you're basically running with something which is very, very close to your optimal solution. Okay, so what I want to talk about now, a little bit about the assumptions in planning that we have, uh, that we have considered here. So what are the assumptions for this? The assumption for this is we actually know where we are. The robot knows where it is. So if it is a start location, I'm again at my blue bucket over here. I need to know that I'm here at the blue bucket because if I'm in reality somewhere else, of course I may compute the wrong plan, right? So it should be pretty obvious that we assume to know where we are. And we assume to know that the map is perfect, the map is correct, right? We assume, we know where the wall is, we know where we are, all fine. And we assumed that we actually execute what we tell the system to do. If we tell the system, go a meter forward, we assume the system goes a meter forward and not 95 centimeters, right? And so these are three key assumptions that A star assumes. And A star, the solution by A star is only the optimal solution if these three assumptions are actually met. The world doesn't change, we know in which state we are in, and we know what we, go, what we want to execute, the pattern will actually execute. Uh -huh. So I'll give you a good example. Let's say I'm going very close to a wall. Let's say the table is a wall and I'm going very close to a wall. If, I tell, if you tell me, go a meter forward, I can go a meter forward. Everything is perfectly fine. Everything is good. If I'm, however, not going a meter forward, I'm going a meter forward maybe 10 centimeters to the right, because I'm not precisely do what you tell me, I will actually bump into the obstacle. And this will lead to a collision. Or if I'm slightly localized, I'm not here, I'm actually here, but a little bit rotated. And you say, go a meter forward, I will actually bump into the table. So if I don't execute 
exactly what you tell me or I don't know precisely where I am or if the map is not correct and the table doesn't look like this but the table is also here this will lead potentially to collisions with the environment okay so in practice what happens your robot is slightly delocalized you have an uncertainty in your pose estimate maybe you're two or three centimeters off maybe you're off by a degree or two degrees and if you just blindly execute your motion commands you will run into collisions very likely especially if your platform who wants to go through a doorway doorways are typically very narrow and if the platform is big it just fits through the door and if you're a little bit localized, delocalized you will actually bump into the wall or likely to bump into the wall and especially the case that A-star planning as it prefers shortest paths it will guide the robot as close as possible to obstacles because these are typically the shortest paths again if I'm going from here to here the shortest path I can do is, is actually go as close as possible to the obstacle to reach my state because it's the shortest thing I can do I could go a little bit back and go here it would be safer because of a safety distance here but it's clearly longer and if I'm only optimizing for shortest paths what the system will do is actually guide me really really close to obstacles so I'm basically sliding along the obstacle so in reality you need to find a trade-off for that that you don't want to have the system actually to go really really close to obstacles and the other thing which often leads to problems is you have your grid basically eight connected neighborhood grid if you are if you think that your walls are not aligned with the grid structure let's say the grid is not in this direction here along the wall but it's actually rotated by whatever 20 degrees you will actually make weird movements going along the grid and actually get the suboptimal solution maybe at some point in time you get too close to a wall as well so by having the grid structure not being aligned with the environment structure you may run into suboptimal solutions okay so let's look how can we actually solve this especially how can we solve so this is actually harder to solve um, but how can we actually solve the first two problems that even if you're not perfectly localized and we want to avoid that the platform goes really really close to obstacles any ideas what we could do what could we do to avoid that we go super close to obstacles what would be the easiest solution you can imagine of everyone should be able to come up with a proposal on how to solve that is to basically increase our obstacles we just make all the obstacles 10 centimeters larger in every direction so in my map now this is a table that makes the table a little bit bigger so then the platform will keep this 10 centimeter safety distance around the obstacle and this is a very neat solution solves a lot of problems in practice what could be problematic if it's a solution exactly so assume I want to go from here to this side and the only way I can do this actually do like this so it's just a passage where I just fit through and that's the only way to reach the other side because these walls are infinitely long there and there I have to be very careful and I need to go actually closer to the obstacle than this 10 centimeter security distance that I have so the only way I can reach is I actually have to do it I have to take that risk there's no other way to do it then I should actually do it but if there's a lot of space if this thing is that big then of course I should go nicely in the middle through this narrow passage so just expanding the obstacles helps in large number of situations but it creates other problems new other problems luckily there's a fix for this and there's a fix that most of you all of you should have heard already and this is the trick of a convolution there's something that all of you have heard the photogrammetry course we did convolutions with Gaussian kernels and for the others it's basically see this as image blurring so if you think about it in image processing you have an image and you put basically a Gaussian kernel over your color values basically smear out uh, the color values like blurring an image what it basically does it takes for every node in the world or every pixel in an image a mixture a weighted sum of the pixel location itself and its neighbor intensity values 
And for the, the planning example here, this refers to I'm taking the cost of a cell and say it's a weighted sum of the cost and its neighbor cost. So if my neighbor is an obstacle, this will increase actually the cost of visiting this node a little bit. So you can think about this as occupancy probabilities. So if you have, let's say, is a one, let's say assume we have a 1D map. So this is my 1D map and this is cell number one, cell two, three, four, and five. So those two are occupied, so occupancy probability one. So this is kind of a wall and this is free space. What I can do is I can perform a convolution with the Gaussian kernel, which basically for every cell over here computes the weighted sum of its neighbors with, with the Gaussian weighting. You will actually get values which look like this. So this means you take some of the occup occupancy from the occupied cells basically smear it into the free space. So what you're basically doing, you basically in, in this table example, you're generating a Gaussian gradient going down here. And if you associated this to a cost, it's cheaper to pal go through cell four, let's say if you envision this to be a long corridor, along four, but if it's a small doorway, then this would go up here again and you just go through the minimum, which is exactly the middle of this doorway. And what you do in practice, of course, you do a combination, you do this and this, and then you typically take the maximum operation of the two because you still want to keep those obstacles being obstacles, but locations close to obstacle will get some increased cost. And the kind of occupancy probability you can, uh, can see is cost of visiting that place. And basically it's a Gaussian blur, so it's basically a weighted sum of the neighboring occupancy grid values. It's a standard binomial kernel. Uh, the current state counts half and the neighbor counts a quarter and just add them up. And this is how you generate your, 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 your grid map. So you basically have a convolved grid map where your obstacles get basically smear out into the free space. It's not that you extend them and you're not allowed to visit them, but you make it more costly to visit those nodes. So the robot will always avoid, will take into account detours to avoid reaching those places. But if there's no other way, if it's a very narrow passage, you basically have a minimum one here. The only thing you can do is actually squeeze through the middle. And this is exactly the behavior you want to have. If there's no other way, you have to be very carefully going through the middle and if there's enough, enough free space around, it's better to make a small detour and drive around that free space. Okay? So this is a very practical solution to, to most of the problems that you have. Okay, with this, uh, at that point in time, make a five minute break. So we are continuing here and I just realized that time-wise we would be a bit too much to also dive into MDPs today. Um, so from the amount of stuff I thought of teaching today, I kind of overestimated my capabilities. So um, we will drop the MDP stuff for today and just look into A-star planning and let's say go a bit more into the details of the A-star planning, maybe finish five or ten minutes earlier um, rather than starting a completely new topic today. So the MDP stuff will not be covered in the lecture today. And also for the exercises, for the next exercise, you only need the A-star MDP it was not part of the exercise. So you should be fine with this. Um, so what I want to do now is continue with the a star and make sure all the A star based planning, which is also from the relevance point of view in terms of applications, the key thing. And now I'll go a step further in the A star planning and look into what happens if we change our configuration space. So we are still assumed to live in a 2D world. Let's say we have our X, Y, and orientation uh, of a platform. But in addition to this, we have the translation velocity and the rotation velocity we want to take into account. So we want to actually generate not only the trajectory and then in some way generate speeds to go along this trajectory with the controller. We want to do this in a joint fashion where we say we want to plan also the um, velocities in form of translation velocity and rotation velocity in the planning system itself. So we're changing our state space from x, y, theta to x, y, theta, v, omega, translation velocity and rotation velocity. Okay, so from basically x, y, theta, which was our planning problem in the regular 2D world, if I'm just taking into account movement from one cell to the other and, and, and the rotation. Or let's say even, even in the examples we have showed, it was actually just x and y. So this was the grid I showed, was just an x and y grid. 
What we do in practice, what's standardly done, is you go for x, y, and the orientation, which means that the system can only turn in spot. So you basically can turn in spot and then go to the next neighboring cell. And if you go, want to go to this cell, you have to rotate first and then go to this cell. So you're basically stacking up eight levels of orientations into this, on, this, on this grid structure, on this kind of 2D structure, because these are the four orientations you can have. And now well, the next step is, if you want to take into account velocities, we can go for x, y, theta, and then a translation velocity and a rotation velocity. It's kind of a five-dimensional configuration space where you do planning. So we can take the kinematics of the platform into account. For example, if you have a platform which can change the velocity only in a certain range because it has acceleration constraints. So you can't immediately speed up to maximum velocity. It takes you two or three seconds until you reach maximum velocity because you're slowly accelerating. Maybe even the platform could accelerate faster or, 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 um, or de decelerate faster, but you maybe want to have a very smooth motion. So it should slowly accelerate and go faster because it's just more predictable and people who are interacting with the platform in the environment are better in taking this information into account. So what we want to do is now we want to go to a kind of five-dimensional configuration space in A star so that basically we can take directly, if you have a sequence of those states, the velocity, the, the, the translation velocity and the rotation velocity directly as commands and send them to the platform. So I don't need an underlying controller. I can directly, what I've planned, take and execute it on that platform. Okay? So we are now, the plan is a sequence of those configurations from the start to the goal. And what I then need to do is I just need to take out those velocities and execute the velocities at the right point in time to the platform because then the platform will actually, assuming it does what I tell him or her or it, um, reach the goal location. Okay. So the problem that we have, so what, what we then do if you think about our search space or configuration space, this is our, sta our, our state vector, or our configuration space vector, is a 5D vector. And what I can do is I can go from one point in time to a second point in time. Okay? And this transition from here to here has constraints. Because I can assume that the change in translation velocity, the change in rotation velocity is limited. I cannot go from zero meter per second to two meter per second within from one point in time to the other. I need to accelerate slowly. Let's say, whatever, 0.2 meters per second square. So per second, I can only accelerate by 20 centimeters per second. Get faster. So if, if I have zero velocity in the beginning, and next time step will be 20 centimeters per second, then 40 centimeters per second, 60 centimeters per second, 80 centimeters per second, one meter per second, and then I have the maximum speed. So it would take me five seconds to accelerate, for example. I want to take this into account. So that means the states I can reach depend on my predecessor state and the velocities matter. Basically, the velocities tell me how these states look like and how I can change those velocities at the next point in time. Okay, so the problem that I have if I do this is that this makes, creates actually a huge search space. So if you think about a two-dimension, if you think about a one-dimensional vector, which is just stores the x locations of all possible, so let's say just the x dimension here of this room. Let's say this is the x axis, and then let's say this is, whatever, 10 meters. We discretize it in 10 centimeter cells, so we would have 100 states, 100 states in one dimension. Okay? So this is a very small state space. Now I add the y dimension to it. It's again, now let's say maybe the lecture was 20 meters over here, same discretization. I would have 200 states in y. The number of states that I have would be then 100 times 200, so 20,000 states, which is already much bigger than these one-dimensional states. If I then add the orientation into the game, if I just have eight orientations, I would need to take it times eight, but if I maybe have a discretization which is, whatever, let's say 10 degrees or five degrees, this would be times 72, so it's 20,000 times 72, definitely over 100,000 states. If I now add velocities to it, it gets more and more and more complex. Because what I'm basically doing, I have the Cartesian product of the dimensions of the state space. So all the possible dimensions in x times all the possible in y, times the one in the theta, times the one in the translation velocity, times the one in the rotational velocity, is an explosion of the state space. 
You basically, whenever you add a new dimension, you basically have an exponential growth in the number of states that you're generating. So very quickly, the runtime that is needed to solve those planning problems will explode. Because there are just too many states you can explore within a short period of time. Let's say you want to do this for online motion playing, say 5 hertz to every 200 milliseconds you should actually execute this to make sure if someone steps in front of the robot, the robot has enough time to replan and react to this unforeseen obstacle. And so we need to be able to do all those operations very fast. And the only way to do this is actually to restrict your search space. So what you want, you can't search the full search space all the time, or even if then something happens. So you have to um, boil down your problem to a simpler problem that you can, where you can run the planning system more often, faster. And one of the ways to do this is to actually use these ideas of the heuristic, this Dijkstra-based heuristic, and add the additional information so that for some dimensions of your state space, especially those which are big, which are the x, y dimension, you take these ideas of the, of the, of the Dijkstra heuristic that we just explained before into account when you say, at least for x and y, I know which states are pretty good. But for the velocities, it's harder to constrain myself. And so this is something that we can do is that we are, but what we basically do in the end is we have a multi-step algorithm to simplify our, our search space. So we say, okay, let's take our map and update our map based on our sensory input and plan optimally using this 2D, just 2D algorithm in X and Y. We plan a pass in X and Y. And this basically says, okay, this is the optimal shortest pass if you just take x and y into account, not taking into account orientations, not taking into account velocities. And then say, okay, let's take those states, expand them a little bit. Let's say we allow to move a meter to the left and a meter to the right from this trajectory. And only in this small area, take all the orientations into account, all the velocities into account. We basically build a small channel or funnel around the, the optimal 2D path and expand the search space only in this small space space. So we can only plan this small, small space. Because you say, the path that I planned with, with just taking down x and y, so this configuration so it should actually be not too far away from the optimal solution. And so, and then let's take the neighborhood of this path, of this solution, and there we do the full planning. And then we do the full planning in just kind of this smaller state space. So we can say, okay, First, I have my map, and I just update my map. So this is, let's say, my, the goal where I want to be, I or my platform. I take my sensor information into account, and I add those obstacles to the map. So red means obstacle, and the black thing is actually kind of this, this con resulting from the convolution, so the space where the robot can go if it really needs to, but typically it tries to avoid these darker areas. And red is basically forbidden areas, because these are the actual collisions. And then, I can take this information in, into account to quickly find my map in the space. So this is an example. This could be the optimal heuristic from the Dijkstra I showed before. And this should be a video, actually. No. OK, no, it's not a video, sorry. You basically have your path, and then you make a gradient descent in the space and reach your goal location, just basically by following these the gradient, basically, you're, you're basically surfing on the gradient in this cost function. Okay, then we want to build this restricted state, state, state space. And the, again, the assumption is that the, um, the path that I generate lives near to this optimal path. So if we go to our example, let's say this is our path. Let's say, okay, let's build a local neighborhood around this path, which is called the blue areas, up to a certain point. Let's take this as a sub-goal and do the 5D planning only where X and Y lies in this blue area. So I'm only extending kind of this small area into this five-dimensional space. And then you're actually able to do the high-dimensional planning only in this small subspace. So in the end, you will generate a trajectory which leads you here. And then from here, you can then, if you're there, actually start to plan further and come up with the uh, with the optimal state space to do this. So there's an, just a small example. So this is how it looks in reality. Um, so you're starting here, you want to go here, and 
Do you see how the thing grows? And you see those white dots sometimes popping up, it's slightly overlaid. So you see here these white dots. And this is actually the trajectory that the system took into account, taking into account the, the actual emotion commands to reach this place. And you see sometimes it, it deviates a little bit from the trajectory because it, due to the acceleration, it, it, it makes a slightly different turn, but then actually drives and reaches its goal location, taking also the velocities into account. And you see at every point in time, if I just rerun this video, um, you can see it only plants whatever, five meters ahead, trying to reach the state, and after every second you just push the sub goal a little bit further along the trajectory, and it will actually generate smooth trajectories which guide you towards um, the sub goal, and then due to the acceleration you're deviating a little bit, so the overall pass is slightly longer in reaching the goal compared to the one if you have, would have planned completely in the 5D space because due to the acceleration you're deviating a bit from this pass over here. Um, so there's a little bit that you lose compared to expanding the full state space but you can actually execute this online. And you can actually also run this in reality so this is a platform moving around the boxes. This is what it sees. It basically adds those boxes as new things pop up. Here plans with a 2 meter planning horizon. If, even if you walk into the thing, obstruct the space it can automatically plan around and then drive around with a platform um, taking smooth motions into account, rotations and velocities and then also fit through the convolution smoothly through um, the obstacles in the environment. And so by taking this information into account, restricting your search space, you can do the more expensive stuff in small areas and the, the, the cheap planning in the large areas and combine both things in order to be fast. And you can actually estimate how large you make this, this area, this channel around the optimal trajectory. So if you have a width of 70 centimeters and the sub goal one and a half meters ahead, you're actually deviating and come up with suboptimal plans. But the larger you make the channel at some point in time, whatever, five meter lengths, one meter ten in width, you actually don't find any difference anymore in terms of path lengths compared to the optimum. And the thing is, this is something that you can still compute online. This is something which is far away from being computed online. This takes minutes or hours to compute, and this can be still done in 200 milliseconds. So, and by combining those, you just lose only a very small amount in optimality, but you can actually execute this on real platforms. So in reality, what you do, in, if you have those planning problems, you, need to, you can't use the out-of-the-box planner in most of the cases because it's too slow unless you're in a very low dimensional state space. As soon as you want to have more in terms of taking velocities into account or other constraints, your state space typically starts to ex explode and you need to make assumptions or constraints to fix this. Other things would be you just only plan in 2D and then run some kind of smarter local controller which just try to follow the trajectory and avoid obstacles. So this is kind of the standard approach that you say, keep your planner as simple as possible and then just have locally reactive modules which try to be close to the plan trajectory and but try to avoid obstacles. Or you can integrate into planner and change things. There are basically different ways on, on how you can do this. But what is typically important that you always have a module on the lower level which has some basic obstacle avoidance or emergency stopping uh, behavior that you can actually execute and avoid planning um, in this whole space because you're not fast enough to do this at very high frequencies. So typically today those security modules run at 10 to 20 hertz depending on the speed of your platform. So the fast things every 20, so 20 times per second, they actually make um, the decision, is my path still valid? Is there an obstacle interfering with me? And if so, they make some more reactive, not necessarily optimal <coughs> navigation decision by at least avoiding uh, collisions with obstacles. And then if there's more time, actually replan a better pass, but at least make sure you can ensure safety and not do any collisions with any other objects. So, what we have shown today was an introduction into planning on a higher level. Higher level means not in the terms of low level controls, um, but high level motion planning in terms of how can we actually find optimal paths which guide me from one configuration into another configuration. By providing a sequence of configurations on the way which gradually bring me to my goal location. So if I want to go again from here to there, I'm basically providing a sequence of configurations which are always close to each other and therefore gradually guide me towards my target location. And this is the basic for most navigation systems. So even your SatNav device in your car basically performs this, let's say, a variant of a star um, to some degree that guides you towards your goal. 
pre-computing your route. The only thing is that you as a human are basically the executor of the task and um, the system, it's much easier for the system because it doesn't need to take the human into account in the sense uh, how is the human exactly reacting. Of course, if you then go on a different route, the system has to replan, but the kind of execution and the mapping of what happens in the real world um, to what the system says is actually left to the, to the human operator. But in the end, similar algorithms than the one presented here run on those SATNAV devices. And typically, they just plan the trajectory once and then just update the trajectory because it's a continuous replanning problem, so it's a bit different, but in theory, you could run something like A star also on those systems to actually plan your optimal path. So with this, I come to the end for 2019 in this course, um, and we'll continue next uh, year in 2020 in, I think it should be the 10th or something like this, or 11th, so the first Friday when teaching restarted, and then we'll continue with this course here. So thank you very much for coming here, for showing up, and have a nice, relaxed Christmas break.